Good afternoon, happy Thanksgiving everyone and welcome to today's update on COVID-19 in New Brunswick. Speaking on behalf of the province today are the province's Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Jennifer Russell, and the Honorable Dominic Carty, Minister of Education and Early Childhood Development. Bonjour. Hello everyone, happy Thanksgiving and welcome to today's update on COVID-19 in New Brunswick. Today, speaking on behalf of the province, will be the Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Jennifer Russell, and the Minister of Education and Early Childhood Development, the Honorable Dominic Cardi. Thank you, Bruce. Merci, Bruce. And thank you for everybody who's here on our Thanksgiving Monday. Good afternoon, bonjour à tous. I hope everyone um, has had a good Thanksgiving weekend in the safety and support of your family and friends. But I also wanna offer my special support for those people who changed their plans at the last minute uh, for their holiday to uh, slow the spread of COVID-19. And I know for an actual fact that this did occur because uh, a friend of mine was trying to get to Turkey yesterday and and she was told that the place where she was getting it from had had eight cancellations. And so at least eight people changed their plans that I'm aware of, but I'm, I know there are many, many more. So thank you for your conscientiousness. Uh, and I also wanna thank you for taking time out of your holiday to watch today's briefing. I want everybody to have the straight facts about what's happening in our province so that we can all be stay safe and stay healthy. Je sais que the fact is that this is not the Thanksgiving day that any of us wanted. But COVID-19 doesn't take holidays. So we must take care and be vigilant to slow its further spread in our province. Today, there are six new confirmed cases of COVID-19 in New Brunswick. These new cases are related to the ongoing outbreaks in zone one, where there are now 39 active cases, and zone five, where there are now 32 active cases. There are three new cases in zone one today, an individual aged between 50 to 59, an individual aged between 70 to 79, an individual aged between 80 and 89. There are also three new cases in zone five, an individual under the age of 19, an individual aged 20 to 29, an individual aged 60 to 69. There are now five individuals in hospital, one of, of which one currently requires intensive care. To date, we have reported 278 cases of COVID-19 in New Brunswick, of which 76 are currently active. The Thanksgiving that we were all hoping for or that we wanted, but um, as I said, COVID-19 doesn't take holidays. So we really do have to take care and be vigilant to slow its spread in our province. And while there are six new cases of confirmed uh, COVID-19 in the province, uh, we are doing everything we can to make sure all the contacts are traced and that um, uh, they are isolating at home. So I'm just gonna go through the same list that I just read in French of all the new cases. So the, the new cases are uh, related to both of the outbreaks, uh, one in zone one and one in zone five. So right now in zone one, there are 39 active cases and in zone, sorry, in zone one, there are 39 active cases and in zone five, there are 32 active cases. So today there are three new cases in zone one, one individual aged 50 to 59, one aged 70 to 79, and one aged 80 to 89. And there are also three new cases in zone five, an individual under the age of 19, an individual aged 20 to 29, and one aged 60 to 69. There are five individuals in the hospital, one of whom currently requires intensive care. So far, we have reported 278 cases of COVID-19 in New Brunswick, of which 76 are currently active. We are in the midst of a global pandemic and our circumstance can and will change very rapidly along with the information research and evidence-based uh, um, information that we receive uh, every day and every week from whether it's the World Health Organization or Public Health Agency of Canada. Barely a week ago, there were three active cases in this province and now we have outbreaks in two health zones which include potential incidents of community spread um, and the way to prevent that community spread, obviously, is for everybody to do their part. Um, I'm a parent. I have teenagers. And sometimes you're 
asking them to do something or expecting them to do something and if they choose not to or give an argument as to why, then you say, well, it's the right thing to do. Yes, but, well, it's the right thing to do. So sometimes the right thing to do isn't always the easiest thing to do, um, and, but that doesn't change the fact that it is the right thing to do. So we really can't give the virus any chance. It will establish itself and spread widely exponentially, and that's why we have acted with resolve and determination to slow the spread. The mandatory order has been amended to require the use of masks in all public indoor spaces in every region of New Brunswick. Dans les zones in Zone 1 and Zone 5, where outbreaks are now underway, masks are required in all outdoor and indoor public spaces, as set out in the orange phase of the New Brunswick Recovery Plan. I know that many of you are asking what we can do for our fellow New Brunswickers who are now living with more restrictions due to COVID-19. First, last and always, we can be kind. When you return to work tomorrow, please keep in mind that the mask order applies to all areas of your workplace where you may interact with others. That includes lobbies, corridors and meeting rooms. Keep a mask with you at all times and gently help your coworkers adjust to this new reality. In Zone 1 and Zone 5, where outbreaks are now underway, masks are required in all indoor and outdoor public spaces as set out in the orange phase of the New Brunswick Recovery Plan. And I know that many of you are asking, what can we do for our fellow New Brunswickers who are now living with more restrictions due to COVID-19? First, last and always, we can always be kind. And when you return to work tomorrow, please keep in mind that the mask order applies to all areas of your workplace where you may interact with others, including lobbies, corridors, and meeting rooms. Keep a mask with you at all times and gently help your coworkers adjust to this new reality. Families will now be returning from the orange zones to other parts of the province. Please be kind to them as well. They're returning to their workplaces, to their schools, and public health has given clear instructions on returning safely. What they require most from you is your support and empathy. If you have traveled to an orange zone over the long weekend, you and everyone you are traveling with must continue to observe the orange phase requirements for a period of 14 days. You must wear a mask at all times, indoors and outdoors, no matter where you are in the province. And I'd like to remind everyone about how we define indoor and outdoor spaces for areas under the yellow phase of recovery. These include areas in the public where employees interact, such as retail businesses, malls, service centers, places of worship, restaurants and bars, except while eating, etc. Organized indoor gatherings in public spaces, such as weddings and funerals, common areas like lobbies, elevators and hallways, and public shared spaces, including those in private sector and government workspaces, public transportation. In Zones 1 and 5, now in the orange phase, there are further restrictions which prohibit the operations of barbers, hairstylists, tattoo artists, and other businesses that require close personal contact with clients. Um, this information is on our website. As you know, we have revised what the different phases allow and don't allow uh, compared to the very beginning of the pandemic uh, in March when we had our first iteration of the phases. And I know that this can be an area of concern and uh, confusion for many people, including business owners. And, um, and so I do invite you to look at that information very closely. And I do want you to know that, again, when public health makes a public health recommendation. It is based on a risk assessment based on that individual area's risk. Um, and we don't take that lightly. So I, I have had some heartbreaking emails from business owners, et cetera. So I do understand that this is very, very tough. And that is why I'm asking everybody in this province, every citizen, to do the right thing, to wear a mask, to physically distance, because that is what's going to keep us in the yellow phase, and that way we will be having the least amount of impact in terms of people's daily lives, whether it's schools or businesses, et cetera. So the order for the orange phase areas also mandates the closing of swimming pools, gyms, fitness centers, casinos, and business uh, bingo halls, and pro prohibits all sporting events. D'autres restrictions s'appliquent aux zones 1 et 5, qui sont in zones 1 and 5, now in the orange phase, there are further restrictions which prohibit the operations of barbers, hairstylists, tattoo artists, and other businesses that require close personal contact with clients. The order for the orange phase areas also mandates the closing of swimming pools, gyms, fitness centers, casinos, and bingo halls, and prohibits all sporting events. 
Indoor gatherings of more than 10 people are now prohibited in the orange phase zones. And outdoor gatherings of 10 or fewer people may take place with physical distancing. These restrictions are necessary due to the higher risk of spreading COVID-19 in these settings. Barbers and hairstylists have sustained close contact with their customers. In gyms, the sharing of equipment and elevated activity drive up the risk. Bars and restaurants in the orange phase areas may remain open, but tables must be set at least two meters apart and staff are limited to short contact with patrons. Those who live in zones one and five should limit their contacts to their two household bubble, maintain two meters of physical distance from others and follow all public health directives such as regular hand washing. Outdoor public spaces are anywhere the public may congregate other than the yard of a private single dwelling residence. This includes parks, playgrounds, markets, dog parks, etc. anywhere you may be sharing space with many others. When you're walking and jogging and with members from your bubble in areas that are not crowded, such as trails or beaches, masks are not required. Les espaces publics extérieurs. Outdoor public spaces are anywhere the public may congregate other than the yard of a private single dwelling resident. This includes parks, playgrounds, markets, festivals, dog parks, etc. Anywhere you may be sharing space with others. It's important that everyone in all regions of New Brunswick actively self-monitor for symptoms of COVID-19 and there is a list on the coronavirus webpage at GNB and seek testing when symptoms emerge either by calling 811 or using the online self-assessment tool which has been working extraordinarily well. In a number of recent cases, individuals showed no symptoms or very mild signs such as a runny nose, so please monitor your health and request a test using the online form. Students who are traveling from an orange zone or who have been exempted from isolation requirements under shared custody arrangements are required to wear a mask at all times, indoors and outdoors, for the next 14 days. The next 14 days will be critical in terms of how we see things unfolding here. And, uh, and that's why the next 14 days are really, really important for people to be extremely vigilant. So all post-secondary institutions, public schools, private schools and early childhood learning uh, institutions and it is the responsibility of the parents, guardian or student to inform the teacher upon their return to school on Tuesday. There have been several confirmed cases in Northern New Brunswick schools over the last several days and Minister Cardi is going to speak to some of that information. We have had meetings pretty much all morning long uh, with the emergency operations team, um, with Department of Education around the different um, uh, risks up in the north around schools. And when we say uh, a, a, a case in a school, we don't necessarily mean a case in the school. We, we could be referring to a case affiliated with the school, meaning the person either works or goes to that school, but the exposure or where, they, where the transmission occurred was not actually in the school community, but it could have been outside the school community. But we are providing all of that information around the risks at each school, depending on whether it's a, an adult or a student or an employee, and whether it's a transmission that occurred in the school or outside of the school setting. So all of those risk assessments have been done on an individual basis based on all the contact tracing that public health has been doing. So that information has been communicated with each and every school and the specific um, staff and students who are uh, implicated have been contacted directly by public health whether they're diagnosed with COVID-19 or whether they're a close contact. So all of that work has been done and I'm so proud of the teams working on the ground right now to make sure that all of that work has been happening all through this entire long weekend. So thank you to all the staff, the entire team on the ground that has been doing that work tirelessly all weekend, including the EOC staff. Please keep in mind that a requirement for your child's schoolmates to self-isolate does not necessarily indicate an outbreak at their school. Again, they could be a close contact of a confirmed case from another setting outside the school. So that's why we really, as parents, we need to be very cognizant of the fact that you're either being told to self-isolate because you're a close contact or, or you, you or your child have been diagnosed with COVID-19 because you were tested and we're calling you with the result. So I want to remind those who regularly travel from Quebec into the Camelton area for work that they are eligible for twice weekly testing for COVID-19, even if they are not exhibiting symptoms. Now, I know I've heard many comments about symptomatic testing versus asymptomatic testing and mass testing, et cetera. 
We're really focused on the cases and the close contacts right now and people who are symptomatic, but there are situations where we will continue to test asymptomatic people, such as the one I just mentioned, because the risk is so high outside of our borders uh, in the Quebec area. So we are very cognizant of the fact that we rely on the workers uh, to come into our province, and so to mitigate that risk, that is the, those are the steps that we're taking. To request a test, complete the online COVID-19 test request New Brunswick NB form and select traveler from outside the Atlantic bubble in the are you a member of one of the following groups section. In the coming days, we will likely see more confirmed cases of COVID-19. And if everything goes well, those cases will be the people that we've already identified as close contacts and they're already self-isolating at home and therefore they can't transmit to any other people. So fingers crossed, we have a lot of work ahead of us and we still all have to work together to be vigilant. And as each case pops up, we will continue to do contact tracing. We will continue to contact those co close contacts and make sure that they're able to self-isolate properly uh, with as much support as we can provide. So many of you will be, may be asked to self-isolate to reduce the spread of the infection. And this is not easy. I know that's not easy, but given the incubation period of the virus, that will take two weeks. Um, so we were, are going to really be focused on that. That makes it all the more vital that everyone follow the public health directives and do your part to stem the tide of COVID-19. It will reduce the number of people involved. It will reduce the length of the wave and the outbreak. It will reduce the time we spend in the orange phase in zones one and five. But we have to work together if we want to reach that goal. We will not reduce the risk to zero, not until there is a vaccine or another effective treatment. By acting now with kindness and patience, empathy and tolerance, we can lower the risk and go about our lives safely. We can reduce the numbers of people that are involved in both of these outbreaks. We can decrease the amount of time that we have to have those zones stay in orange, but we all have to work together. On this Thanksgiving Day, I am so very thankful for all the sacrifices that everyone is making so that we can all stay safe and healthy. Thank you for doing the right thing, and I am counting on you to continue to do the right thing. Thank you very much. Mr. Cardi. Thanks, Dr. Russell. And uh, happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Joyeux Action de Grâce. Not the Thanksgiving we would have hoped for, but still a lot to be thankful for on this, uh, this long weekend. And as the doctor said, special thanks to those who lost their weekend to work incredibly hard across the province to pursue the contact tracing exercise that's now underway to try and make sure that we can push COVID-19 back out from our borders. And that same spirit of hard work from the folks inside the civil service and public health that's gotten us to this privilege point where we continue to be doing very well in comparison to most of the rest of the world. Uh, I know that uh, those people wouldn't do this job regardless of the day or the time, but the fact that they're making the sacrifice on a, on a holiday makes it extra notable. Thanks as well to the citizens of the province. I was uh, at a cannabis MB uh, outlet in my constituency uh, and talking with one of the staff there, and he was saying how he'd been planning for a long time Hadn't seen his family in quite a while, was planning on getting home, go to Campbellton and see his family. But when he heard the message come from the doctor that travel was not a good idea, he canceled and he said, I said, I apologize, I said, wish we didn't have to do this. And he goes, no, you guys are doing what you can to keep everyone safe. It's the least I can do is give up a, give up a family dinner. The other day I talked about uh, changes that affected the Listigouche First Nation in Quebec, and I just wanted to briefly mention uh, them again, thank Chief Darcy Gray and the council at Listigouche for their incredible cooperation throughout this process, that uh, all the difficulties we've had in being able to support education for that, uh, that, that school population of young students who live in that First Nations community in Quebec, but who travel to school in New Brunswick and have for years as part of a great relationship between that community and our province's school system. The fact that's had to be interrupted, the responsibility there lies at the feet of the government of Quebec, who were unable to work with us on security protocols. And the, the First Nation Council have been absolutely exceptional in their cooperation from top to bottom, beginning to end. So I wanted to make sure I made that point today. 
Alors, merci encore pour tout le monde d'être ici. Thank you everyone for being here. Happy Thanksgiving despite these despite these these difficult circumstances. I am here for another update on the changes in the school system. Um, on top of the provincial changes uh, given to us by Dr. Russell. And, uh, uh, members of the Janeville Elementary School, some members of that school community have been notified of a possible exposure to an individual who tested positive for COVID-19. And that EECD will be following up with the rest of that school community in the hours to come. So potential contact tracing, as I mentioned, has been carried out and was going to inform all of our uh, future decisions as it has informed all of our decisions to date. And at this point in time, the decision is for Janeville Elementary School to remain open for tomorrow. And we're working closely with school districts and schools to ensure they're prepared for when we, whenever we inevitably have a case in a school. And we'll be very quick to make changes on decisions if those are required based on the evidence that we hear from public health or from Dr. Russell's team. We are so proud of all the work that was done quickly by the entire team, the schools, our district partners over this long weekend. All of our planning since March was done to enable the system to have a coordinated response to a rapidly evolving situation. We were also always hoping that it wouldn't come to the situation we're in today, but we are in it and now we need to act. I am confident and I trust our team that's been working so hard for the past six months to prepare us for today. We will have an operational response plan response day tomorrow, Tuesday, October 13, in the Alley Rainsboro and Académie Notre Dame. Day, October 13, we're going to have an operational response day for LE Rainsboro and Académie Notre Dame. So that means that for students, that they will not be attending school tomorrow, and they should wait to hear from your school community about for further instructions. So staff are going to use this day to roll out their response plans. Students will learn from home. And this is exactly what we'd always intended, because as I've been making clear, I hope from the beginning of this pandemic, it wasn't a question of if or when we would have outbreaks like this, but how we would handle them. And so far, our, our handling has been world class. But now is when that, ha that uh, response planning moves out from the behind the scenes work done by civil servants, people in public health. And it becomes something that involves all of you as citizens of the province. We need your help, as Dr. Russell has put it. We need your help to make sure that the work of your contact tracers can be done. We need your help to support the back to school plans that have been out there and made public for a long, long time. Our goal is to keep schools safe and open under as many circumstances as possible. So as previously indicated, for students at Sugarloaf High School, they're going to be engaged in online learning on Tuesday, October 13th and on Wednesday, October 14th. And that's only for Sugarloaf High School. And that's in part to, to make sure that we can accommodate the students from Listegush, who I just, just mentioned. The school is going to be in touch with families to communicate any potential changes to the school schedule for Thursday or Friday. So we know the situation in Zones 1 and 5 is changing rapidly, and that's causing a degree of anxiety that I completely understand. And I'm going to again emphasize the importance for two things, kindness and accuracy. That kindness is obvious that we've been privileged here in New Brunswick to have uh, had some of our closest contacts with the disease for a long time, being fear and a bit of anxiety when we see an out-of-province license plate. But now th the disease is here in our province and active. Teams are working to make sure it's controlled and that we don't see widespread community spread, transmission. But we're likely to know people who are going to get COVID-19. And they're likely to recover at the same rates they do elsewhere in the world. But we're likely to see cases of illness and of course, all of our hearts go out to the folks who are in hospital, or in especially the individual in intensive care. But when those folks come out of hospital, we've got to be kind to them. We've got to be kind to people who've needed COVID tests, because the more that we make this into a big deal where we stigmatize people, the less likely people are to get the tests, to self-isolate, to do the right thing, to protect all of us. So we shouldn't just be kind for the benefits of those around us. It's self-interested too. It's to the benefits of ourselves and our families that we do the right thing at this difficult moment. And the other point around accuracy of information. 
I'm continuing to hear far too many people online and offline spreading information that they know is not true. Or if they don't, they should. We are doing our best in government to provide accurate, up-to-date information with these briefings, with the dashboard, which has been slower to be updated in recent months because it wasn't as needed, but that's going back up to the hourly updates that had always been uh, expected in the spring. And we will go back to making sure that you've got every single piece of information you can gather. I was talking with Dr. Russell before this briefing about the steps her team is making to provide ever more accurate and detailed information so that you can be part of this response because that's the only way this is going to work. But I'd ask for folks who are online, think twice, think three times before you tweet, reshare, post something that you're not sure about. Do not spread information about people you think might be sick. Do not spread information about stories you might have heard from a friend of a friend about a school or a, a long-term care home. The way that we can get through this is by making sure the information we share is accurate so that we can make the best decisions based on that information. We have two problems today. We need to use information that is 100% accurate. We need to avoid at all costs to share information that is not verified, information that comes from rumors and not official sources. Because we are all New Brunswickers. We are all in this together and we all want this pandemic to be over as soon as possible. At government, we want to share as much information possible to help you in this task because it is your task and our task. It is a collective job to fight against this virus. And the only way we will be able to do it is if we have information that is true. So please think about it twice, three times before posting something online about this outbreak. Please also be kind, have an open heart and open mind towards people who are infected, who are touched by this situation in the months to come and weeks to come. We were lucky for quite a while, you know, the only people who had COVID were outside of our borders, but now we have our very own outbreak in the province and it is very likely that we will know people who are infected. Please don't share their personal information. Don't share information based in rumors. And continue showing the same spirit that we've seen in this province since the start of the pandemic, this spirit that allowed us to be in such a good position compared to the rest of the world. Regular updates to all school staff, to families, those are going to go through the schools and through the districts. And of course, we are going to continue to make sure we protect the privacy of all the individuals involved. So in many cases, we need to be really careful about sharing information about whether someone's a student or a staff member. Because think about yourself or your family members in that position, you want that information to be protected. We need to make sure that we have absolutely clear information going out to people and we'll do our very best and we assure you that there will be absolutely no risk to you as a result of any of the information that we're protecting because of privacy concerns. Because our first concern is public health and Dr. Russell has broad powers to share all information. So please continue to listen to Dr. Russell and her team. So the schools we talked about specifically today, these schools are all in the orange zone. So parents are reminded to ensure students have enough masks to meet the enhanced, enhanced mask use policies for orange zones. So if your school is not in the orange zone, things are continuing as they were when they were in the yellow zone. So to reiterate the message from the, a couple of days ago, masks are going to be required on the bus, indoors and outdoors, throughout the day, except when eating or engaged in physical activity. For students in K-8, to they'll be asked, able to remove their, their masks if they're working silently alone at their desks. And these policies are going to apply to all students, to all teachers and staff, unless they are not required to wear a mask for medical reasons, and this is going to apply throughout the duration of the orange phase. All intramural, interscholastic, and extracurricular sports and activities will be suspended in these zones until they return to yellow. Let me repeat this. With these changes, we will see that the mask policies for the orange phases will be amplified. These policies have changed since last week. 
You can find the details of these policies on the government on the on the Departments of Education's website. I'd like to take this opportunity to remind you that just because a student or staff member is asked to self-isolate, it does not mean that there is a confirmed case in a school. If there was a confirmed COVID case in a school community, this information would be shared with all the families and members of the community and also with the public, just as Dr. Russell has done since the start of the pandemic. May be identified as a close contact to a case for a number of reasons. So just because they've been asked to self isolate does not mean that they will test positive. So, as I said on Saturday, please remember that no news is good news. So, the orange phase document with all the details for K 12 schools and early childhood education is available on the Department of Education and Early Childhood Development's COVID 19 updates website. And all these measures, again, only apply during the orange phase to the schools within the orange phase areas. As soon as we go back to yellow, those schools go back to yellow. And unless there's a specific reason for any exceptions, the activities that were allowed and that were normal that we became used to in the yellow phase become uh, daily life again. So reiterating Dr. Russell's message that please take every precaution that you can. I've had people asking me, I was planning on going to, to visit this school for X reason. I was planning on taking a trip here and there. If you don't have to go anywhere, stay home. If you can reschedule, cancel, push events back to a later date. The next two weeks are going to be critical in fighting back against these two outbreaks in, in zones one and five. So please do everything you can. Accept the small inconveniences in life in the next couple of weeks to avoid not just inconveniences, but potential tragedies for families across this province. So for all the schools that are still in the yellow phase, you continue on with your regular operational plans. So that includes masking, the restrictions on sports and extracurricular activities, all the things that you become familiar with over the last few weeks, those are still in place for all schools in the yellow zones. So parents and guardians should ensure that your children have got, reg have got more masks than maybe that you've given them before, multiple masks so they can wear them throughout the day for the next couple of weeks. You do not want to be without your mask. Tout le monde a besoin de souvenir. Everyone needs to remember. Parents and guardians need to ensure that their child has multiple masks, enough masks for the entire day for the coming weeks, maybe more masks than usual. Also, remember that students must refrain from participating in sporting events and other extracurricular activities for the next two weeks. By taking these quite simple precautions, you can contribute to keeping our classrooms safe and healthy, but also the health and safety of the entire province. We work together in a way that I think the whole province has been proud and even surprised at in the last six months at the way we've managed to reach up above so many other places in the world. So please, again, be vigilant. Please follow the directives from public health from Dr. Russell's team and make absolutely sure that you take every step possible in your day-to-day -day life to protect yourself and your community and your family against this deadly disease. And before I go, I want to clarify one thing that earlier on talking about the updates for the dashboard, those updates are every day, not every hour, before I give the folks who are responsible for that a heart attack. The, uh, of course, as usual, I'll be happy to take questions here from, uh, from the journalists. One question, one follow-up, as usual. And uh, happy to take that from now. And again, hope everyone has a good remainder of their weekend. Stay safe. We're all doing the best we can to keep everyone safe. Before we start, could everybody please mute? Shane McGee, CBC. Oh, excuse me, I have to say something. Nous allons maintenant procéder aux questions des journalistes. Vous avez toujours le droit de poser vos questions dans la langue de votre choix. Chaque journaliste aura une question et un suivi. We will now proceed with questions from members of the media. Each reporter will have one question and a quick follow-up. You have the right to pose your question in the language of your choice. Shane McGee, CBC. Hi, this is a question for Dr. Russell. Um, the, the rules around outdoor uh, masks, um, 
Well, can you tell? Can you elaborate on why this was implemented? And uh, given that we've heard that there's lower risks of transmission outdoors, is that Shane? Hi, Shane. So basically, um, when a phase orange is in place in a zone, we are really trying to contain things very, very aggressively. So if you're going to shut down businesses, if there's any way that you can make sure that there is very, very, very little risk uh, in terms of con continuing to be able to contain the virus, then we will, we will be trying to take those steps. So having people mask indoors and outdoors, then that means that it's continuous. There's Everybody's protecting each other, and we do know that even though people can be um, mingling outdoors, they don't necessarily always physically distance. And again, we are just in the containment phase when there's a, an outbreak where we just want to be as um, aggressive as we can to get things under control as soon as possible with the fewest number of people affected uh, for the shortest length of time. Thank you, Dr. Shane. Do you have a follow-up? Yeah, given the number of, of new cases that we've seen over the last week, um, how is the province um, is the province able to keep up with the amount of contract tracing that's required to be done? Well, thankfully, yes, we have, but uh, it hasn't been easy or simple. So we've basically mobilized all the four uh, regional teams across the province to be able to make sure that we stay ahead of uh, the timelines that we need to do the contact tracing and make sure people are isolating. Uh, the other piece of that work is the is not just contact tracing, uh, but also making the connections between the different contacts to make sure that they are in fact all related as opposed to uh, community transmission. So all the work that has needed to be done over the course of the last week has been done. Uh, uh, quite uh, an extraordinary effort, uh, but we have managed to meet all our targets and uh, we're, we're, we're confident that the people who needed to be contact traced are at home self-isolating right now. And so the next two weeks are going to be critical because of the incubation period to watch to make sure that the people that are self-isolating at home, if they develop uh, symptoms and, and become COVID positive, that they are not at risk of infecting others because they are self-isolating at this moment in time. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Mr. McGee. Vicki Hogar, Charlotte County TV. Thanks, Bruce. My question is for Minister Cardi. Minister Cardi, experts say it's not so much class size that matters in terms of COVID-19 spread in schools, but rather classroom density and air space. How are school ventilation systems being continuously monitored to ensure they are adequate, especially as the winter months come into play? Hey, thanks for the question. The uh, absolutely the air quality is, is important and we have regular assessments for air quality in our schools uh, and it is uh, something that has been on our radar right from the very beginning of the pandemic is making sure that that air quality and those standards are kept to the highest level. Uh, we've still got work to do but certainly in the context of COVID-19 we've made sure that uh, our classrooms are safe for those reasons. At the same time, class size also is very important. These things all go together. They're all part of a package of responses to try and protect our, uh, our students and our professional staff who work in the schools. So the question was about air circulation in schools. It is absolutely important, of course, and it ties into other initiatives to reduce transmission of COVID-19. That does involve reducing the number of students in classrooms, we take all of this very seriously. These are all different elements of a comprehensive and integrated response in our fight against the virus. Thank you, Minister. Ms. Hogarth, do you have a follow-up? I do, thanks, Bruce. I'm just wondering what criteria would trigger a long-term closure of a school? So at this point, we have uh, we've not made any changes to those criteria, which are all identified in detail on the ECD website with a lot of different variables on there. And uh, obviously, if there's anything exceptional that came up in the face of a pandemic that is new to the world and uh, presenting us with new challenges, so we follow the template that's been worked on in consultation with public health over the last number of months. And if anything urgent came up, take direction from public health on how to respond to it. Alors pour les cas de fermé, comment quand est-ce qu'on va uh, asking about potential long-term school closures, well, we will do it using the metrics that you can find in the plan on the department's website. The plan explains which elements are needed to consider closing a school. Of course, if there's an emergency, if there's a new factor, which is always possible in a pandemic with such a new virus, 
We will follow Dr. Russell and her team's advice at Public Health. Open and safe. Ça, c'est le but, de, que les écoles restent. That is our goal. We want open schools and safe schools. And yes, it's hard. And yes, sometimes it will worry parents and families and teachers. I completely understand that. But we can't lose another school year for mental health reason and education reason. We need to recognize the importance of the education system in our society. Removing 10 or 15 percent of a student's total training or education will have consequences for this generation. It doesn't mean that we can't have safety measures to make sure that our schools are as safe as possible. I said this is a really, this is a frightening moment. We talk about trying to keep schools open as much as possible. But that's always been the goal, because we can't afford to lose more than 10 percent of a child's education, losing a year or more schooling. So our goal is to keep the schools open and to keep our schools safe. And to do that in the context of a virus that's always changing and a response to it that is always being updated based on the latest scientific information, thanks to Dr. Russell and her team and the folks at the Department of Health. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Ms. Hogarth. Travis Fortnum, Global TV. Hi there, my question is for Dr. Russell. Um, I'm just wondering if you're able to confirm the five cases that are in hospital, are those linked to the outbreak at Manoir Notre Dame? So four of them are linked to the outbreak in zone one, and I believe one of them is linked to the outbreak in zone five. Second question, Mr. Fortnum. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Laura Lyle, CTV. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, this question would be for Dr. Russell. Um, given that uh, cases in other provinces uh, in Atlantic Canada remain relatively low compared to New Brunswick currently, um, I'm wondering if there are conversations underway from other public health officials involved in any other kind of temporary, maybe temporarily closing New Brunswick borders off to the rest of the region. Um, I've been having conversations with the Chief Medical Officers of Health from the other Atlantic provinces quite regularly um, and keeping them up to date on the situation here. So my understanding is that um, from Nova Scotia's perspective, they've never really had any closures um, in terms of not allowing people in, but they've always had a 14-day self-isolation period for people outside the Atlantic bubble. Um, as of right now, they are not planning to make any changes based on the outbreak here in New Brunswick, the two outbreaks rather here in New Brunswick. And uh, with respect to Newfoundland, um, I think, well, actually all three of the other provinces are advising their um, the people that are coming back from Zone 1 and Zone 5 to their uh, respective provinces that they should behave the same way that we are directing people to here within New Brunswick, that they should continuously mask and monitor for symptoms for the next 14 days. Thank you. Laura, do you have a follow-up today? Yeah, just a quick one. Um, I'm just wondering about any additional testing sites or testing resources that, that have been brought into the sites of the two outbreaks, so Campbellton and Moncton, you know, um, where people can go to get tested, that kind of thing. So right now in, in, in Zone 1 and Zone 5 and then previously in the St. Stephen area, we had really boosted our ability to test in those areas. And so the 811 uh, phone number is one way, but we also have a self-referral um, form online. And my understanding is that they're keeping up quite well with the testing uh, demand at this point in time. So uh, the extra resources are definitely on hand and certainly even the 811 resources were, uh, are, were also on standby in case there was a surge in, in their uh, demands as well. So as of right now, uh, we can meet those demands in a very timely manner. So people who have symptoms uh, can get tested, uh, just call 811 or go online and fill out the online assessment form. Thank you. Ms. Lyle? We're good? Oh, all good. Thanks very much. David Caron, La Quédie Nouvelle. Oui. Hello. I was wondering if we could have a bit more information about the situation in um, Janeville Elementary School in the Chaleur region. Uh, question. So first important note, note is that Janeville is in a region that is not in the orange phase. It is in the yellow. And so we are reacting there right now to, uh, again, a possibility of a contact 
and the contact tracing is being undertaken. And everyone in the school community will be notified about that. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, public health has already notified uh, some families. Excuse uh, the répondre anglais en avant. Uh, Sorry for answering in English first. I would like to say that the Janeville School is in a region that is still in the yellow phase, not in the orange phase. So right now we don't have any intentions of changing that. We're studying the possibility of a contact that would involve someone in Janeville. Public health is already in contact with some families, and the Department of Education and Early Childhood Development will be in touch with the rest of the school communities in um, as soon as possible. But in an outbreak, in a period of outbreak, there will be cases like these. You know, today it's people in Zone 5 and Zone 1 who need to to get used to being in touch with um, public health authorities and the Department of Health for contact tracing. But that is something that will probably happen in other parts of the province. To get ready to get used to this, that having possibilities of cases, people being asked to self-isolate while waiting for test results. This isn't a reality the rest of the world has unfortunately had to become very used to in the last number of months. And the fact that we're having to get a bit more used to it, again, hopefully only for a short time, this is just a normal part of how we respond to the pandemic, and this is how it will work. So everyone, again, put on your masks. Stay home, please, for the next 14 days as much as you possibly can. Do you have a follow-up for us? Yes, I have another question for someone. Maybe you've already answered in the past, but I might have missed it. Regarding the mask order in public spaces, how much would this measure be enforced? Will there be fines if someone doesn't wear it? Or are we expecting, um, you know, a certain uh, exemption for people who don't wear it? Hi. I know that there are a lot of questions about wearing masks outdoors. This only applies to regions in the orange phase. And we're doing this to allow us to reduce the outbreak's impact, to reduce the number of people affected, and also to reduce the length of the outbreak. We want to be able to return to yellow as soon as possible for these regions. And we want businesses to be able to reopen, so it's important that we all work together. Regarding wearing the mask outdoors, this only applies to spaces where people might come into contact. So streets, sidewalks, trails. But if you're really alone, there's no one around, you're on a walk, maybe um, cycling or jogging, or you're with your family bubble. So if there's no one near you, you don't really need to wear the mask. But I would say in the orange regions, it's very important, if in doubt, wear the mask. If you're not sure, that is the safest thing to do. And I would like if everyone could follow the public health guidelines. I know some people disagree with the guidelines, but they're there for the protection of the entire province, of all businesses, of our mental health, and to help maintain our schools open. It's very important that we all work together for this. Andrew Roy, Brunswick News. I have a question for Russell. Um, Dr. Russell, can you give us a little bit of an outbreak, uh, an update on the outbreak at the Manuel Notre Dame, please? I'd like to know how many cases uh, now confirmed linked to that and whether you've found the source of the outbreak. So the good news is, is m the contacts have been traced. All of the co all of the cases and contacts in zone one are all related to the manoir. So again, thank you to all the contact tracers who have been doing an excellent job. Their attention to detail is phenomenal. So we have 39 cases in zone one right now, all linked to uh, that outbreak, um, including the manoir. Okay. Um, Do you have a follow-up, Mr. Wah? 
I do, thank you. Um, what about the Campbellton region outbreak? Have you figured out how that started? Well, again, the good news in Camelton is thanks to, uh, and Dalhousie, thanks to all of the contact tracers and everybody on our teams who have been working so, so hard. Uh, all of the cases have been contacted. Their close contacts have been contacted. All of the cases are linked. And so we are very grateful for that um, because, as you know, community transmission is the thing that we dread the most. And there is no community transmission in either of those outbreaks right now. Um, and uh, with respect to the manoir, in terms of our uh, response, the plan was to test all the patients and all the employees at the manoir every few days. And so that next round of testing is tomorrow. And if everything goes well over the next 14 days, then the new cases that pop up are the people that we have contacted that are self-isolating and can't transmit to every, anyone else at this time. So uh, so again, we, we all need to be working together to, uh, to make sure that we achieve uh, a really good outcome with respect to keeping the numbers low and keeping this outbreak short and sweet and small. That is our hope. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Mr. Wa Alexander Silberman, CBC. Thank you, Bruce. A question for Dr. Russell. Uh, what discussions have you been having with the other Atlantic provinces about the bubble, and what has the tone of those discussions been like? Well, again, with any outbreak, and we have two ongoing at the same time, it's all about uh, updating our risks assessment regularly as we receive new information. So obviously at the very beginning of an outbreak, uh, until we contact Trace, uh, we really don't know the extent. So we can't say, oh, this is bad, this is good, this is medium in terms of our risk level and what our concerns are. So I've just really kept in close contact with Dr. Strang, Dr. Morrison, uh, Dr. Fitzgerald is actually on holidays, um, but uh, I've kept them in the loop in terms of texts and, and emails and phone calls. So they are aware uh, with the messaging that we have each day in terms of our risk assessments and how things are going. Uh, then they are aware, okay, well, we're on standby. If we need to change any of our messaging, then we will. If we need to change anything in terms of our public health direction, then we will. Uh, and really, so far, what they've done is they've just used the same language that we have around anybody who has traveled to Zone 1 or Zone 5 over the ho holiday weekend. When they return to their respective areas, whether it's here in New Brunswick, PEI, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, that they follow the same directions that we are giving our uh, citizens around wearing your mask, uh, when you go back to your region, um, please avoid contacting other people, being in contact with people unnecessarily, especially vulnerable populations, um, et cetera. So we're, we're just trying to share the same messaging based on our risk assessments as they evolve. Thank you, Doctor. Mr. Silberman, do you have a uh, follow-up? Yes, I have a follow-up for Dr. Russell. Uh, so going back to the Campbellton region outbreak, do we have any more details at this point on possible source and how it ended up getting to these three schools? So all I can tell you right now is they're all linked and there's no community transmission. I don't have uh, any more information to share at this point other than, other than again, we're, we're confident that all the contacts have been traced and everybody who needs to be self-isolating is self-isolating. And in terms of moving forward, we will continue to give you the most up-to-date information that we can. And again, anybody who needed to be contacted from public health in the school communities that are implicated, they've all been contacted. Thank you, Mr. Silberman. Thank you, Dr. Will the Netfall of Edzio Canada. Yes, I'm here. Hi. My question is for Mr. Cardi. Where are we with schools that have cases of COVID-19 in terms of, of uh, isolation, is it an entire class, a few classes? What will it mean for the student um, and how will they be able to return to school? I'm sorry, it was a bit hard to understand the question. Could you repeat? Maybe the line's not so good. I'd like to know where we are now with schools that have COVID-19 cases. How many people will have to self-isolate? Is it a classroom, many classrooms? What is the state of the situation? Uh, I'll do it in English after. So we will be contacting every person, every family that needs to be contacted for safety reasons and for public health uh, safety reasons. 
we cannot tell you which class, how many classes, and so on, because it could start, you know, rumors, and it would be so negative. About anything except for confirmed case numbers, because that's the stuff that actually matters. If there's an outbreak, you need to know about it. When we're doing testing and trying to tra trace, do contact tracing, that's the work that's going on to make sure that we're all kept safe. But we need to remember that, again, that we're protecting the privacy of people as well as protecting the health of everyone. Do you have a follow-up question for us? Yes, thank you, Bruce. My question is for Dr. Russell. The MLA for Campbellton Dalhousie was um, considering offering testing to everyone in Zone 5 and closing down all the schools. Is this considered to offer testing to everyone who's in an orange zone? I understand the concerns and I understand the questions regarding our response to the outbreaks in Zone 5 and Zone 1. This is all done based on the information available and also the advice of the uh, medical officers in each region. So they assess the situation, they collect the information, and then we make a decision to either close a school or to offer testing based on all that information. The first outbreak in Campbellton meant that we tested, I think it was 25% of the population, maybe um, 12,000 people, and there were no cases in people who didn't have symptoms. Right now, we have enough resources to offer testing to anyone who has symptoms. That is not a problem, and we've also ramped up measures for people who travel every day, so essential workers and so on. People who travel to and from Quebec just over the border can are eligible for testing twice a week. We make our decisions based on the available information. So that's for testing. Now, in terms of schools, a decision to close a school would either be based on operational decisions where there would be so much close contact that so many people would be self-isolating at home, and it could be staff, teachers, um, students, so many people that it's just not realistic to remain open in that situation. Sometimes maybe there would be multiple cases, there would be too much risk, um, transmission risk is too high, too many people have to be isolated. So that could be a situation where there might be a close contact, but no transmissions case, no transmission risk in school. It's something that happened outside of school, but because someone is linked to the school, maybe a student or a staff member and so on, there are some risks. But we assess the risk and then make our decision to either close the school because people are at risk or it wouldn't be functional with too many people in isolation. Thank you. Merci, Mademoiselle Paul. Margot Castadère, Radio Canada. Oui, bonjour, cette question. Hi, my question is for Dr. Russell. Yesterday, a government spokesperson was com confirmed that uh, wearing masks outdoor was mandatory everywhere at all time. But it's a bit different today. So why? Why put in place such a measure knowing that you are the first government of Canada to request masks outside? So that's not new, actually. But what's new is that in yellow zones in New Brunswick, masks are being worn inside uh, indoor public spaces. That was announced last week. But situation where masks are mandatory indoors and outdoors, that's in our orange phase plan. And that was decided at the same time as we decide to wear masks inside in the yellow phase. So it's a bit of a coincidence that it all happened at the same time as outbreaks, yellow phase, orange phase. It all happened at the same time, but really, there is, it's the distinction between yellow and orange phases. 
when in orange, the masks are mandatory indoors and outdoors. Do you have a follow-up question? Yes, that doesn't really answer my question. I understand the difference, but what informs such a decision and such a measure? I think you can find information on our website regarding the three phases. It has changed since the start of the pandemic in March. When the pandemic started, we had each of our phases with lists of triggering events that would lead to a move to a yellow phase, to a regression to orange or to red. One of the triggers is whether the public follows public health guidelines. And we did, and the Department of Public Safety has done a survey that tells us that a percentage of people don't wear a mask. Um, it, it was more than we wanted, and that increases the risk risks. And that's one of the triggers that was used to decide to change to orange phase. So it's really important. Voilà la fin de notre mise à jour. Merci beaucoup et joyeuse action de grâce. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone, and that concludes today's update. Thank you.